this book. This is written by Mike Paddock, who is at uh, the Hale Library at Kansas State University and is also active out here at Kanza. And this is, in my opinion, the best book for wildflowers for the state of Kansas. But putting in Kansas wildflowers as the search engine, there it is. Kansas Wildflowers and Grasses comes up immediately, and that's the Mike Haddock website. And you can, just from here, you could go into the search by color, and they have the colors listed if you wanted to just avoid this page. This is the front page. You can search the wildflowers by color. You can search them from, by time of flowering. If you wanted to, you know you were just looking at grasses or looking at sedges trees and shrubs. If you knew the common name but wanted to see if the common name matched the, the photo of the flower that you have found, there's a couple of different ways to approach this. Right now, we really don't have anything blooming. Um, is the red elm slippery? I, it wasn't last Sunday. It was the last time I looked. So that's going to be our, our first one. Yeah. Down, down by uh, Cakes Creek, off the nature trail, We'll be looking for the red elm blooming. American and Siberia will be really close. So they'll all be the same week. And, and once that goes, then it just Boom. cascades. <laughs> it just cascades in spring. And we'll be we'll be looking for getting records for the phenology, the timing of the first whatever, first bloom, first arrival of our migratory species. First, or first emergence of our hibernating species. Brad does, but I don't know if anyone else does. Uh, Ken, I think, does. We have uh, a Facebook site for Kanza Environmental Education Program, and we have a Facebook site for the Kanza Prairie Nature Trail. Two separate sites because they're two separate audiences. Uh, the Nature Trail site <coughs> is quite a bit larger than the Environmental Education Facebook site, but I've been posting photos. Really, as an outreach, activity to get people to maybe see the wildflowers and learn the wildflowers and so I've been posting them and I've been trying to to, to stump the experts because I think that's what I've got it whittled down to is the experts I've been looking at. Did I stump you? Yeah, I, I check every day. Do you? Yeah. Have you been? I haven't been commenting because someone else, maybe it's you. It's I've been commenting. Oh, you did? You quit commenting? I recognize well, a couple of Well, I haven't commented but every once in a while. Well, sometimes I throw in. Yeah. Okay, so I'll go ahead and show you. Yeah. Oh, this one. No one has yet. Oh, okay. No, I, 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 I let that one off because I couldn't figure Earl. out. It looked like an astragalus or something. Earl's got it. Go ahead. Uh, American fish. Boom. Yeah, oh, uh, that's fish. what it looked like. And Nancy would yeah, have known that too. Uh, only if I'm out there looking at it <laughs> in real. And it's not crown badge. This this one. That was the that was the bone. Yeah, I didn't see that. <laughs> you guys know this one? So red bud. And, and, that's, and that's also another, another lesson in that not all wildflowers are herbaceous, which would be the botanical term for the soft, fleshy thing. Sometimes you get, you know, the woody wildflowers. Think of freesia or free, no, forsythia. Think of forsythia, not freesia. All right. Um, So great web, great website, especially if you're interested in learning the plants. So yesterday we talked about the bison loop, and I wanted to go through a couple of specific logistics about the bison loop, so you understand what the activity is like. The bison loop is typically not a standalone activity. In other words, it is usually paired with the kids doing something else. A normal schedule would run like this. We would have a 9.30 arrival of a group. And they would most typically be doing a hike. By the way, 
when the groups say they're going to arrive at 9.30, they could be arriving any time between 8.45 and 9.45, 10.15. You have to remain really flexible. If you're, if you're dosing out here, you have to remain flexible and uh, keep your sense of humor intact. It really helps. So for a scheduled 9.30 arrival, we ask that docents be here and be ready by 9 o'clock. So, like I said, this is typically a hike, and hikes are typically going to last between, a short hike would be an hour and a half, a typical hike would be two and a half hours. So, by 12 o'clock, they're done, they're hot, they're tired, they're hungry, and they come and have lunch. The lunch is usually up here at the picnic tables, and we have, obviously, places for them to sit, and we have bathrooms in the, in the barn. We do not really have lunches longer than half an hour. You know, kids have been trained to eat really fast. Mm -hmm. um, for lunch, we usually have one to two docents that keep an eye on the kids during lunch and make sure that they're putting their trash in the right place and their recyclables in the right place. We have a can for plastic and we have a can for aluminum um, and then we have a third can for general trash. And we, we try to recycle as much as possible. Uh, and then the docents also help make sure that the kids are getting to the bathrooms and back safely. So the typical start time for a bison loop is 12.30. Oftentimes, the docents that are doing the hike are not the same docents that are doing the bison loop. There's usually a switch here, and so for a 12.30 bison loop, we would ask that the docents be here and be ready by 12 o'clock. Each bus, and this is the buses that are going around the bison loop, each bus holds about 44 kids. If it is a group of 60 kids, we're going to need to have two buses. <coughs> if they're really little, they can sometimes cram Teachers do strange things. They sometimes cram them on. Did you do a bison loop, Kathy? Yeah. That's my last one. 27. We have oh. 27. But they yeah. tell you in those school buses that there can be three to a seat, and that is horrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's just miserable for everybody. Yeah. It can happen. You guys are like wizards. Kids are bigger wizards. these days. <laughs> Kids are what? They're bigger. Oh, yeah. So 44 is about standard for the bus. And for each bus, we would like to have one guide and sometimes we can have just one gate person for two buses, right, Haley? Yeah. But one gate person. Mm -hmm. okay. And you're going to have an hour and a half to get around the, the loop. So by 2 o'clock, should be arriving back. And that's, that's, that may be kind of late. Um, they're usually wanting to get out of here between 1.30 and 2, somewhere in there. And the driver of all this is the driver of the bus. The bus driver is on a schedule and they get extremely nervous about maintaining their schedule. So, if this is running late, we, we have options. You don't have to do the entire loop. Okay. You can sometimes go up just to the top <coughs> where the scale, the satellite scale is, there at the bottleneck, and turn around and come back or do the same thing up on the east side. So you don't have to do a full loop. But if you do the full loop, expect about an hour and a half. Additionally, a lot of times the guides will come to us and you know, Ken's done a bunch, Buzz has done a bunch, Betty and Byron, Nancy's done a bunch of bison loops to check ahead of time. So the, the herd moves. And so if you're doing, especially if you're doing a shorter tour, it really helps to know where the bison are. We'd all like to know where the bison are. So that there's one person to check with, right? And that's Jeff. Because Jeff goes out there almost every day. And so oftentimes, Haley or I will check with Jeff to say, where are the bison? And we can tell the guides and say, you know, save your time, just go up the east side. Okay. It really helps to have your, your directional things all figured out before you come out here. You either go up the east side, which is the far gate, or the west side, which is the nearer gate, over by the cottages. So if you just go up one side, turn around, come back, you can do that easily within an hour. 
Sometimes they've done it in 45 minutes. Up here, we've got the bison bags. And the bison bags are kept by this back door that you guys have been coming in. And the bison bags are great for the tour guides, the bison guides. Like, <laughs> what is in here? To take with them because especially when you're getting to a part of the trail um, where there's nothing, there's not much to talk about, so you can pull this honey out. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, so I'm giving this to you to feel and pass around. Can't say it. There you go. And then you can have um, these. That would be a male horn. Right? Exactly. I was just going to ask that, and I'll thank you for coming in. I'm just crying right, out. You ready? Oh, oh. female. Female. All right, this is everybody's favorite thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Is that male or female? Step to the of your toes. I've seen all these because I didn't know it. So, you know, and you guys are loving this, so the kids love it too. And you know, the jaws. And Carol would love, you know, you talk about the diastema. You know, how the fact that, you know, they don't, they don't have, you know, they're not carnivores, so they don't have teeth either. They, they're chewers. And if you want to get really wonky, here you go, Brad. You could talk about how how sharp and rigid those teeth are. What that indicates. What that indicates. Why? And why? Yeah. Have you seen that? All right, Carol. You want to tell everybody what that is? No, I I can't. A vertebra with a huge spinous process. Huge spinous process. This could only be from no. one animal. When he started to pull that out so long and thin, I thought it was going to be a vacuum. That would get the, it's not that the, the coolest the thing ever. <laughs> this is the vertebrae, yeah. the thoracic vertebrae Amazing. from the bison. There's only <coughs> one currently living animal who could have something like this. You know, horses have, have a spinous process, but they have the withers, which is pretty good, but it's nothing like this. So, is that cool? Yeah. It's very cool. Oh, the story behind this is I actually had a, a child found that. It was in Kings Creek. And oh, wow. pulled it up and said, what's that? And I was standing right next to him and I didn't see it. Yeah. I think it was a girl. I think she saw it. It's like, oh, that's coming home with me. <laughs> that's really cool. You know, there's other things. There's some some of the longer hair. So we have two of these bags. Oh, this is cool. This is, okay, so where did this come from? Yeah, this is rubbed off. So this doesn't have the hide. Those are tanned pieces that have been purchased. But this has actually been rubbed off of in the spring. Did you guys have anything you wanted to share about the bison loop that you wanted? Betty is a cowboy poet. Do you ever start reciting poems to him? Uh, not too much, no, because most of the poems are more ranchy type. Of that would be the greatest thing ever if you just made the bus stop and started reciting poems. I'll have to do that. Have to do that. I started writing children's cowboy poetry, and I believe we put together a book. But yeah, uh, I really should do that. <laughs> I think what we use the bison loop for is a, a method of teaching about the Kanza and, and the prairie. Mm -hmm. And we usually try to have the bison as the dessert. So we try to arrange to have the bison <coughs> at the end of, of the tour. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, because once they see those, that's all they want. That's, right. They've seen it all. They don't. Right. They're, they're tuned out after that. Right. They check. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, Nancy. One thing I like to do is I like I like to mix in some history with it, and I will ask the kids at one point to think about what they would do if they had a whole bunch of money at once, and then I'll work into the the. Uh, the the Chicago Fire, and he got his money there, and what did he come out? And he bought these ranches and stuff. So, 
So I try to get as much interactive from them, and it's a totally different subject, but I can then work into this tree and just get them thinking about that. That's great. So, and it also exemplifies how what you do as a docent is, is personalized. You can personalize it as you see it needs to be, and, and what your strengths are, and what direction you can go. Your, your job, there's, there's really, there's no specific science standards that we're trying to address with the bison boat. We have specific science standards that we do try to address with some of our other activities. But the bison loop is really <coughs> experiential. It, it's going out and, and experiencing the prairie. So it can be tailored to what, what seems to be working best for that day. You know, it's not easy doing a bus tour. The newer buses have seats that are about five feet tall, so yeah. you can't even see the kids at all. And I find I walk back and forth up and down the aisle a little bit because otherwise they can't hear you clear in the back of one of those 25 foot, 25 seat uh, buses. Uh, but it is hard because they can't see you and you can't see them. Uh, and most of the buses, very few have walking, have uh, loudspeakers. If they do, you're in, you're, you've got it real easy. But uh, most of the time, I kind of walk back and forth, try to get the kids involved. I do, I do history, I do a little geology, a little bit of bison history, all kinds of fun stuff. So. No, all crowd to one side because that's the side. Side. <laughs> yeah. You have to use your teacher voice. Yes. This this is a by far our most typical schedule. Okay. Um, it takes a while for schools to get here, just physically here. So it is rare that schools get here before nine o'clock mm -hmm. from anywhere. So a nine thirty arrival is is typical. We're doing attendance and getting everybody there. Sure. Yeah. Now, did I hear that you, when they had multiples, that you flip flop, or did I not hear that? Okay. So, so we've, we've got all kinds of different permutations of this schedule. Yeah, but I'll, yeah, same if, one, if, they have, yeah. if they have come, if they have come in one yeah. bus and they were crammed in, one thing that we might do is take half of the kids out in the bus uh -huh. or by sloop in the morning, while the other half hike have lunch, and then flip, and then cram them all in to get them back. So we have different permutations of this. Yeah, Nancy? I can say you have the, when they come out for a science experience, where some of them are doing the lab while you take the right. science and move around. Right. And then you bring them back and take another group out. Right. The, the, the challenge with the flipping is to have two activities of the same duration. And as long as they're the same duration, we can do that. But if you have one activity that takes two hours and one that takes an hour and a half, you have a gap, and that becomes a problem. But that's that's not your problem. That's me and Haley. That's our job, is to work that out with the teachers and to make make everything work. You so you take, don't have to worry about you that. You take time on the bison loop outside of the inside the fence, but outside maybe where you get the kids out one more time before they actually. Mm -hmm. If there's time. I I do almost every trip. It's, it's an individual thing, and you weigh this with how much time you have and the kids. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's just like a fire. It's a prescription. So you just see what yeah. well, There are opportunities. The bison are right along the fence. And uh, the opportunity to stop and let the youngsters go out and be there is, is a good opportunity. But it shouldn't be very long because of the time constraint. But if they can get out, their experience will be enhanced if they can get out of that bus. Yeah. All right. Yeah, go ahead, Byron. We kind of had the ultimate experience with the group then of, uh, of Carlton students who were here on a field trip with a botany professor and a animal, small mammal professor. And we were coming up the east side, and there was a cow standing alone by the fence about a quarter of a mile down from the gate. And as a cow person, you say, aha, it was April. <laughs> and as we were driving up there, she dropped a calf. So you got to see it. And they were just absolutely flabbergasted. They're going to talk about that for the rest of their life, <clears throat> to see a precocious animal born. They'd never seen something like that. <clears throat> I guess I'd like to say, uh, kids today don't ever get outside. And so when they get out here, they don't really know what they're looking at. And, and part, of the, part of the amazing thing is once you get them up on the hill, you go, now let's all look out and see how far do you think we can look 
And also, it's a great opportunity to talk about a watershed because you can see mm -hmm. how that rain all comes down those hills. But just to get them to look outside and say, hey, is Kansas flat? Some of them are thinking about that for the first time. <laughs> it's, the Bison Loop is, is such a valuable experience, it really is, to get out and see the prairie and without a bunch of structures out there. So, yeah, it's a pretty valuable experience. And all of this can be done with a school group in which the teacher has not gone through any other kind of training. And so this is our introduction, especially to teachers, to the prairie for them. And then if they get interested enough, then we can recruit them to do the summer teacher's workshop, which we would have gotten a hold of you, Kathy. The summer teacher's workshop, and then have them do, have the kids do the hands-on science stuff. But maybe you can recruit some of your colleagues. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so, Moving on from that, today we are going to be going, we're going to be talking with Haley about geology and we're going to be going out and taking a look at some, where you can find some of the rocks and, and layers easily within an easy walk of headquarters. And I wanted to show you that your providers have a couple of maps. And yours doesn't. <laughs> and this is going to be under the purple tab, other educational activities. The first document under the purple tab says serving as a guide and you may want to read through that at your leisure talking about how to do that and we'll talk more about the specifics of serving as a guide, but if you read this, this will give you something to start with. Then we have the guide to the nature trail. <coughs> it just gives you a step by, it's, it's kind of a play off of the self-guided uh, tour. Then we have the butterfly hill guide, gives you directions and a couple of points. And then the fourth document in the sequence is a map. This is a map of Butterfly Hill, and I have marked it with a red marker. Mm -hmm. We are the circle. This is where we are right now. If you look at the circle, that's the Holbert Center. And we head south, past the corral, and go up the hill. And that's the Butterfly Hill Trail. So you can visualize that. Mm -hmm. That helps. Yeah. So, so this was the small. This is this is a smaller loop. It is 1.2 miles. It is an easy walk for younger children. If you take a look at the next page behind that, that is the West Loop Trail Guide, and then the next document behind that is the West Loop Trail. Okay, butterfly goes this way. The West Loop Trail sits immediately to the north of Butterfly Hill. They don't call it the North Loop Trail, I just name it. But it's the West Loop Trail. And so, you see it just sits kind of right on top of the Butterfly Hill. So compare those two maps to each other. How, how long did you give the length of the West Loop Trail? The West Loop Trail is a little under a mile, so 0.9. So together they're a little over two miles. And is that information in the volume? Yes, it's okay. in your document. So, okay, so to give you an idea of, of where things are, to visualize this. So the same thing that we're looking at. So today, we'll be walking the Butterfly Hill Trail. We're doing that today. And if there's time, and if you have the inclination, we will continue and walk north to the West Loop Trail. So you can go on those trails and then come back to these maps to visualize them. I just wanted to point those out before we went. Um, our bathroom protocol, as docents, you help us with that because there's a lot of people using those bathrooms and we do not have, remember when I said how many people were out here as far as staff, did I ever mention janitorial? <laughs> it's just, it's us. And so part of our responsibility is to be stewards not only of the prairie but also of the facilities. And so we keep an eye on the bathrooms and we make sure 
that lights are off, that toilets aren't overflowing. Um, like I went in there this morning and the lights were on in the, in the girls' bathroom, and, you know, who knows. But that's one thing that we do as nurses <laughs> is that we just check those before we leave. I did have some seventh graders, seventh grade boys, and they weren't particularly bright because they had asked to go to the bathroom immediately before they left. So everyone knew who it was. <laughs> and they went in and stuffed paper towels <gasps> down the sink oh, no. and then turned the water on. Oh, no. Water on full blast and then left. You know, so it flooded. It flooded the bathrooms, but everyone knew who it was. So their, their record in crime is not real ostentatious. <laughs> What's that? She's going after them. <laughs> they were not 383 kids. Yeah. No. I'm not going to implicate this in the school district, but they were not 383 yeah, yeah. kids. Yeah. Uh, no, so don't worry about that. But we, but, you know, we knew what group it was, yeah. and the teacher knew exactly what two boys it was. But the thing is, I didn't have a docent go in there and check it immediately, so it went unchecked for yeah. for a couple of hours. Oh, so that's just one thing, and and <clears throat> and I didn't do it either. So that's one thing I need to. So I'm telling you guys now that that's something that we all need to do. They're in here. Yeah. They're in here. Yeah. This uh, this map of the Butterfly Hill West Loop Trail. There's one thing that shows up here that we don't get to see very often. See this? Uh, this is the cottonwood limestone layer over here. This jumble of rocks. Uh -huh. the That's the old quarry where all the stone for the barn in this house was uh, quarried on site. You're just down the along in there. It's kind of neat to, you can't see it from the trail, but uh, we'll point out where it is. That's also the, there were excess stones left over, and that's the ones that go off the nature trail. Uh, Tom went over, or Joe went over and got some of those, and they were uh, keeping the water from uh, eroding the nature trail as you go up the nature. That those were locally quarried, and they were just left there. They were already cut and sized. You just had to go pick them up. You go over and look at them. You'd like to take them home, but it's not allowed. So, so if you don't, <laughs> if you don't know, why don't you open it up and it's it moist that you can be soldered with a manual saw? And then that uh, expose the air, that's when it hardens up. So it's very easy to cut through this kind of building. All right. Sorry, yeah, I find it. <laughs> over, over to Hale. Okay. All right. Well, we'll get started. I'm just going to go over some um, general stuff. Um, most of the time, um, when we have camped out, we don't, get, we don't have time to do, we don't have an entire um, geology activity. It's incorporated in with your other activities. So. While you're on the bison loop, you can talk about geology. While you're on a hike, you can talk about geology. But we don't have one specific geology field trip where all we get to do is focus on geology. So um, with that in mind, I'll kind of go over some of the basics, and then we'll go outside. All righty. Geology rocks. All right. So the Flint Hills geology, um, you can look up um, the, the geo geology. You can look at all of the of what there is throughout the Flint Hills inside of your reference materials in your notebook. Um, and that's been in there for several years, so if you're an experienced docent as well, you should have those copies, and if you don't, we can definitely get them to you or they're online. Um, but this is just one cut out of that. Um, this one section of the Flint Hills geology, um, I have highlighted what you'll see on Kanza. The lowest point that you'll see um, is the Neva limestone. Um, and then the highest is the foreign um, limestone. So between those two sections, that covers about 20 million years of geologic history. Um, so we'll go over some of what's there. But again, that's in the reference material section of your docent handbook, and it's titled Flint Hills Geology. <coughs> so not all rocks are the same. You might remember talking about igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary rocks. Um, when you're in school, maybe back in elementary or middle school, but I always think it's nice to just review it, especially since you'll be working with those age of students oftentimes. So um, you've got the three different types, and they're categorized based on how they form. So you've got igneous forms, or rocks that form um, from the cooling of magma, 
you've got metamorphic rocks, which form under heat and pressure, and then we've got sedimentary rocks, um, which form from the compaction and cementation of sediments. Um, and actually, primarily, all of the rocks in Kansas are sedimentary, like you find a rock, likely sedimentary. And the cool thing about sedimentary rocks, um, I'm getting ahead of myself, so sedimentary rocks again are formed from sediments or just particles of sand, shell, pebbles, and other fragments or materials that accumulate in layers over a long period of time and then harden into rock. Um, some of the things that could help you identify them are you could see sand and pebbles or you might find fossils in sedimentary rocks. But the cool thing about sedimentary rocks is that they really tell the story of the past. Um, so just like the rings of a tree can tell you a lot about a tree's past, if you can look at sedimentary rock layers, you can learn about the past environment that it was formed in. Um, there's the law of superposition, which tells us that older rocks are at the bottom and younger rocks are at the top. So as you walk up the hill, you can imagine that you're traveling through time. Um, like I said, from the lowest point on constant to the highest point, that's 20 million years of time that you'll be covering. Um, so millions of years as you walk up or down a hill. The kids love that. Yeah. Super cool, yeah. yeah. Yes. Imagine you're in, you know, time travel. That's always exciting. So, yes. so um, the geologic time scale is usually introduced to students um, somewhere in middle school. Um, so they might have some knowledge of the geologic time scale, or if they're younger, they might not have talked much about it yet. Um, but it's a record of the life forms and geologic events of Earth's history. Um, and scientists developed it by studying rock layers and fossils around the world. So there's tons of different versions, and you have a couple of different versions of the geologic time scale in your reference materials um, in your docent handbook. Again, I'll point out where all those are at the end so you can go. Um, this is one that I just like because I think it's catchy. I like a good picture and a lot of colors. So. Um, but see through here. Um, the rocks that we're going to be um, here at Conda are between 300 and 250 million years old. So over here on this side shows how many million years ago. So that means that all of our rocks are primarily Permian in age. So that's a cool thing to say. The rocks that you're looking at were formed 300 million years ago. Wow. I mean, that's hard to wrap your, your mind around how long ago that was. But um, we can know that based on the fossils that we find in them and then also studying rock layers around the world so okay so here we are in Kansas geology um so we'll call a fork um all of the layers that we have are named um based on where they were located so we've got um for example um at the lowest point the neva limestone member um and it's part of the granola limestone. So they're, it's just a way the names are just based on where they were first described. Um, and then they're broken down further from their formation into member names as well. Um, this is more advanced than you would talk about. You don't ever need to um, talk about you know, exact names or you don't have to memorize these by any means. I'm just going over it because some people find it interesting. It's mm -hmm. kind of cool to know. Um, but um, this would be the lowest layer, and then as you work up, the youngest layer. Um, and you'll notice, if you just look over here at the different formations, it's limestone shale, limestone shale, mm -hmm. limestone shale. And it's just like a layer cake of limestone and shale, and that's actually termed a cyclothem. Mm -hmm. And again, this is the same one that I showed on the front page on your reference materials. So here is just like a cross section that you would see on a typical hill. Um, and then all of the limestones are shown here in black. And then the shales or mudstones um, are in white. So you can really just see um, the layer cake cyclothem that, that's formed there. So we're going to talk about how those form. Okay, so limestones, you might know, are um, formed from marine deposits, so um, shells of marine animals 
um, that consisted of calcium carbonate. Um, when they die, their shells are left on the ocean floor or lake bottom or riverbed where they can accumulate into thick deposits which form our limestone. So limestones were formed during a marine period, which is also something that can be eye-opening for students because yeah. we're in Kansas, right? Um, but when these rocks were formed 300 million years ago, the, you know, it was just, just completely different. We were part of Pangaea. We were a lot closer to the equator. Um, and we did have an inland sea um, that would um, flood the area and then we'll find over time also retreat. Um, one cool thing about limestone and like the best thing you can do in all of geology, I think, maybe, <laughs> if you ask any kid or me, um, is you can put a drop of hydrochloric acid on your limestone because this is calcium carbonate and it reacts with hydrochloric acid and it will fizz. Um, so yeah, I'm actually going to pass this around, so maybe like once per table you guys can do it and then like pass it off. Because um, you can get like a, we'll give you like a little eyedropper of hydrochloric acid, you can take this out on your height, you can have kids find a layer of limestone, a layer they think might be limestone or rock that they think is limestone, they can test it, they can tell you is this limestone or not, so that's cool for them. So if you'll have one person at your table that can show it to the rest of your group. The responsible person age. Yeah. <laughs> so go ahead and take a vote now. Who's your responsible person? That's not me. about this a, a little bit the other day. Is it flint or is it chert? It depends definitely who you ask, um, especially if you're into like dealing arrowheads and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Some people think that flint is only the most pure chert, um, so it could be debated in that way, but um, I'm not going to split hairs on whether it's the most pure or anything like that. A lot of people use the two terms interchangeably, and that's acceptable. So you can call it flint or chert. Um, one thing to note is if they go <coughs> from the Flint Hills Discovery Center, and we said we have that one field trip where they go both, I think they do use the word chert a lot um, at the Flint Hills Discovery Center, so they might have heard it both ways, and so that's always something we could point out, that Flint and chert, we're talking about the same thing. But um, it's, easily, it's easy to identify because of its color out there. We'll find some today. So it's got kind of a gray color, um, and um, so it's formed um, of a silicate, and it's bad on your tires. So, <laughs> um, so if you're driving on a lot of flint, you're going to go through tires really fast. It's like glass when you're driving over yeah, it. Goodyear loves me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So bad for your tires, but good for like fire starters or early tools. Um, you'll see spear points and arrowheads made out of the flint. Um, 
So lots of sharp tools could be made out of that. Haley, where did you get that piece? This piece, actually, I'm going to be 100% honest, is from Google Image Search. Okay, it's, <laughs> it's really glossy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we <coughs> ones, huh? Yes, I well, should have. And, what and I should you have could done. make it that way by tempering it in, in, temp, in hot temperatures. We, we, will, we will be able to find some that look well. very much like that. And we say, I have up here the forms and nodules, and I'm going to show you there's like some really great pieces here like that you can just mm -hmm. see what that means. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing a ton of people, the, the number one question when it comes to plant is, how do you get into the limestone? And that is a mystery. Uh, we don't know how. So it's something to figure out still. So maybe the students that you're leading will be the ones who figure it out, you know? Wait, my whole life for that answer. I know, me too. So these are really cool pieces to look at just because you can see the nodules inside. So I'll pass these around just so you can check them out. Some cool ones. But, and it also gives you an idea of the great color that you're looking for. Some of it's really dark. And see, I think that's where some of the flint versus chert comes in. Somebody who's really into splitting that. Um, I call this more flint, that more chert where it's lost. It forms within the sedimentary rock, but yes. it's a mystery as to how. Yeah. How about that? And is that because that is. It's, 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 really yeah. it's, it's really exciting. Stuff because stuff. it is clumps of it, it's yes. not a layer. Right. Some some of it can be a little bit more sensitive, but yeah. in general it forms in nodules. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. So between each of your layers of limestone, then you're also going to find shale. And shell is um, more just soft or finely stratified sedimentary rock um, that's formed from like mud or clay that's compacted over time. Um, so it's more fragile. Um, and this would form in a terrestrial environment, meaning when there was no ocean covering this area or a shallow sea covering this area. So it's not aquatic. Ooh, how's that? And what caused the oceans to go up and down? 365 days. Is it a perfectly round orbit? No. No. Okay, so sometimes that orbit gets really like every, this is the question that you might be able to help. Every 10 million years, it gets really weird. I mean, really weird. So we have periods of cold because of that weird orbit. And that is the cycle of them, where sometimes we have the predictable seasons, especially at the temperate areas, and sometimes <coughs> the orbit is off, cycle of them, where you would have the glacial, it's colder, you're further away from the sun. And so during these particularly colder times, because of the weird orbit of the Earth around the sun, the glacier built up. When the glacier built up, the water was pulled out of the inland ocean, and it was like the Antarctic, it pulled in out of the inland ocean, and the Pangea area of where we are now became more terrestrial. And then like every 10 million years or so, it, and then it went back to melting, and then it would freeze, and then it would melt, and then it would freeze, and it was these the cycle of them was all based on the weird orbit of the Earth around the sun. Does that make more sense to you? What, this is kind of, what, how do you know what's weird and what's normal, I guess? <laughs> well, it is right. normal that it's the part of the process that we don't have a clue about because it's not in our, in our time scales. Right. From our time scale, it's just fine. It's just what sure. it is. From our perspective, From our perspective right now, but... you know, if you were a beetle, it'd be even worse. You'd have a harder time figuring it out. It's really bright. I think the biggest problem with this is that it conflates and confounds the issues of climate change right now. And so if you want to actually deal with that, you need to also realize that our climate change data is actually going against the typical process right now. We're going into a period of cooling. Yes. We're supposed to be in yes. a period of cooling, right. but we are not indeed cooling. But if we get back to human time scales, and when people say uh, this is part of a normal cycle, that's what you're going to create here when you talk about these cycles. They're going to, kids are going to think it's part of a normal cycle. They've got to realize that a 5 or 10 million year cycle is beyond the history of humans on Earth. Right. right? right. 
Sorry, I, I, no, no, no problem at all. If you want to read up more on this, I was like trying to rack my brain back to like 10 years ago. And um, if you're wanting to read more about the orbits, Milankovitch cycle is what you're going to want to Google. And I Googled it myself. Um, the curiosity is 41,000 years. If that helps, um, if you're more interested. That's one of the cycles. There's yeah. three cycles that coordinate. Yes. Yeah. So Milankovitch cycles, if you want to read more. But. Um, and, and do you want to talk about um, uh, Keith Miller's presentation on YouTube? Yes, there's um, two more um, geology um, professors that, from K-State that have great lectures um, that are available on our YouTube channel. Um, you can look for Keith Miller, um, and I ha I'll have all this in the reference materials. They've written papers that are both in reference materials as well, but Keith Miller and Paige Twist. And so they are both um, from the geology department at Kansas State University and have great information also available on YouTube. Definitely go over your limestone shale, limestone shale, that cyclothin, why did it form? And we're talking about a repetitive cycle between a marine and terrestrial or a like shallow sea <coughs> and um, just yeah. um, its retreat over time. Um, you can find fossils on Kanza, uh, but you're not going to find for example, a dinosaur fossil on Kanza, and that's because of the age of our rock, right? So our rocks, we said, are 250 to 300 million years old. So that was actually before the time of the dinosaurs. These rocks are older than dinosaurs. Um, so the um, fossils that you're going to find, I'm going to see if that pops up. We've got bivalves, um, which are the ancient relatives of clams. Um, so it's composed of two parts. The shell is composed of two parts called valves. And I'm going to pass around, actually go ahead and do that, pass around some different rocks and with fossils in them. You can find all kinds of things. Bailey, if they have a question, your kids got a question about dinosaurs, you can tell them we found uh, remains and they can send them elsewhere. Now, Kansas is a great place for fossils, and if you go to further western Kansas, you'll find the dinosaurs you're looking for, right? So it's just, um, where you're at, if you drive across Kansas, we're actually, it's just like driving through time, it's just constantly changing. So as you drive to Colorado, you're going to be getting younger and younger in rocks, so you'll find more and more life, you know, as it evolves here on Earth. So, we might find bivalves. You're fine. So you'll find bivalves. I'm always excited about fossils. You can find brachiopods. Um, and um, so we've got a picture up here of what a brachiopod would look like. Um, the plane of symmetry runs perpendicular to the hinge line. So, uh, but. And then you can also find rhizoans, which are often um, maybe mistaken for corals. Um, but they, um, we've got some pictures here, and actually I've got a whole box, I think. Let me see if I can pass some of those around. These, I think, came from a geology kit, so these ones aren't specifically found here on Kanza. The other rocks were Kanza rocks, but these are some rhizoans. And so all of these describe life or kind of show life what it would have been like 250 to 300 million years ago. And crinoids. Crinoids are sometimes called sea lilies. They look like a plant that lived under the ocean, but it was actually an, an organism. Um, oh, I skipped. Did I? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, they were the relatives of starfishes or sea urchins. Um, so a lot of times what you're going to find, it grew on the bottom of this tree, so it looked like this, and then that, and they had like these, kind of like that. So what you, this part was a little bit softer, so what you're going to find a lot are the stems. So um, crinoid stems, like this, we have a whole box of them I'm going to pass around, super cool. Ask those as well. The native cherubs would use those as beads. So the little box coming around is crinoid stems, and that is from an organism, not from a plant. So 
Okay. And are crino, are, is crinoid the name of the full organism or just Correct. the Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that would be the crinoid name. So we would refer to it as. Like <laughs> so these are just like little just one Yeah, so that would be just like one little section of it. And it's just make up tons of them. Yeah. And then, what was your Caitlin. Caitlin was talking about yeah. eucalyptus. Um, the eucalyptus are actually super prevalent in the cottonwood limestone. And remember yesterday when we were out on the bike loop, we passed the cottonwood limestone. We're going to look at it again today. Um, but it's just one specific outcrop or um, member of the limestones that we have here on Kanza. And they're single celled organisms that just evolved rapidly over time. So they're a great fossil to find because it tells you a lot like about what time it was made. Um, so we're actually, when we start off our hike, we'll come out, and you can probably see them if you're sitting close to the fireplace, because um, we, all of our um, limestone here in the house is quarried from that cottonwood limestone. So you're going to see a bunch here, but as we walk out the door, um, that cottonwood limestone is just filled with these fusilitids, and they just look like a single grain, um, but they're actually single-celled organisms um, that are really cool. So we'll find those um, as we walk out the door. If you're on your hike with your students and you're not over here by the house, you can also point them out on the barn. Um, isn't that a great place to find them? So those are the fossils we're going to go over. And then um, one last thing to point out, um, things that people will ask for. What happened? So all of our rocks are 250 to 300 million years ago. We're all the rocks from the last 250 million years, right? That's a great question. They have all eroded away. So um, except there are loose sediments, and this is where I got way ahead of myself, deposited on the top um, from a different ice age um, 1.6 million years ago. Um, but that would just be like loose sediment covering. So most of everything that we're talking about with our rocks is going to be Permian in age 250 to 300 million years ago. Yes. So, is the formations like um, uh, monument rocks and like castle rock area are those like later periods that have been that are left over? From yeah. That? As you drive over to Colorado, you're just slowly. I mean, you don't even really realize you're gaining elevation because it just seems like you're driving one flat road, right? But you're traveling through time, and so it's exciting. And so you're just going, yeah, up through these, and you can find Triassic and Jurassic um, fossils as you continue across Kansas. So Western Kansas, if you're looking for your dinosaur fossils. And we have a great map, a great geologic map. Right next door, we'll point it out. Super cool. The, the soil layers. Mm -hmm. Did you see that map already? So if you That's haven't gone into rocks yet, I always just like mm -hmm. to tell kids that rocks rock. Even if you're not excited about rocks and you're just like, no, I only just love the prairie. They're what helps keep Kansas Prairie here and help preserve some of our uh, native prairies because they were impossible to plow with all of that uh, flint and turf was there. So. And they so, make great fences. <laughs> there you go. See, so we all love rocks, even even if you're not specifically a rock lover. So that's my last bit on that. And then I'll just point out there is lots of great information. <coughs> I am not an expert by any means, but we do have experts like on our YouTube channel. Um, we've got a couple of papers in there um, by K-State faculty. Um, so all of this, all these materials are available in your docent handbook. Um, there's a summary of geology of Ponza Prairie by um, Jack Oviet, and he was K-State professor. Um, there's um, geological cycles of the Flint Hills by Keith Miller. He's also, he's got a paper in there and he's also on our YouTube channel. Flint Hills geology is that one page that I was showing you. Um, there's a geologic time chart in there. You can Google geologic time chart and find whatever version you like best, because you can imagine that. Mine was the one with the pictures and all the different colors, but you can find tons of different versions of that online. You should have a fact sheet, too. We do have a fact sheet now. I need to add that in. Um, I'll, give you, I'll go get them for you. We're going to take a break. Perfect. And then, yeah, right. final thing um, is the geology of the cognitive limestone. There's an extra thing on there if you're more interested in that. Um, but also, the geology fact sheet. So, tons of good geology in your handbook reference section. Take a break. And then, hi. Questions first? Yes. 
Yeah, Kelly, sorry, I have one more question. Sure. So I, I know, like, in riverbeds and stuff, I find cranberries and, and some Brazil and every now and then, okay. loose. Mm -hmm. But mostly you're going to find them, like, embedded in the rocks, right? Right, yeah. And these you, like, you've taken out of rocks somehow. Yeah, so we're going to point out some great places to find things on Butterfly Hill specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and there's actually one place up by headquarters. It's a great place to find um, bivalves. But kids are like surprisingly good at finding things. So even if it's still in the rock layer, they see stuff. Yeah. Um, so just keep an eye out for it. But yeah, like with the crinoid fin, um, I mean, sometimes you'll find them like that. But um, then you'll sometimes just see like, the circle inside of a rock layer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they won't always be so clean or perfectly right. preserved, but yeah. you know what we talk about how important it is to share the prairie because they haven't ever seen the prairie and stuff like that. Years ago I was shocked uh, because my students challenged me about these fossil organisms. And I had five gallon bucket of microfossils. And they kind of perturbed me, so I put a pile of microfossils in front of every kid and told them to go through and find out how many animals they could find. And they did. They found seven or eight different kinds of animals in these little microfossils. And I said, so what kind of animals are they? And they figured that out. And then all of a sudden, one of the kids said, wait a minute, these are all marine animals. I said, yeah, exactly. And I got this 20 miles away from them. And they went, what? And it suddenly hit me that, you know, just like we've talked about everything else, kids not getting outside, spending too much screen time, it occurred to me they never looked at a rock. And this was 20 years ago, you know, a rock that had fossil in it. And it totally changed their view of life because they, they realized this ancientness of life for the first time. It was, it was a tough deal. So I'm arguing that your fossils on these rocks are as important as the prairie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's seeing. Yeah. Yes. Holding it in your hand. Picking yeah. it up out of that. You know where it came from. Mm -hmm. And it, and think of the stories. Yeah. The story behind what you're seeing. It's, oh, it's the coolest thing. Because I've got this at my house. I live north of Wamigo where the glacier stopped. Yeah. And so I've got the pink Sioux quartzite in my front right. yard. And Excellent. It's the coolest thing. But then in the backyard, I have huge layers of cottonwood limestone with fusel linens and I mm. found crinoids and I was going to show you the other day I was like I, I actually okay I actually put a crinoid on my microwave and we had some of the the kids over the I call you kids so the the graduate students over and I it was a plant I mean I, I laid it there to see if anyone noticed that there was <laughs> a 250 million year old animal fossil sitting on top of the microwave I mean, how cool is that? This is an animal fossil. It wouldn't be unusual at my house. So I, I do, I do stuff like that, and, um, and yeah, nobody knows, but that's okay. See, now you know that I'm sadistic. I will tell you, they notice my ball horns. Yeah. You have one. I have one sitting over my desk, and every See? time people come in, they go. Can I come in? Is it safe? <laughs> so he's he's kind of sadistic too. So here we are. But but rocks are. It's exactly what she said. Rocks are the reason why we're here. That's rocks. Rock. Go ahead, Betty. Well, we have yellow limestone four miles away from here, but I don't think I've ever found it here on Collins. Is it here? I have yellow limestone at my house, and it's it's cottonwood limestone. With well, I'm yeah, assuming it has kind of magnesium, maybe, Mr. Chemistry I don't know, but I just wondered if or I'll, I'll, have you ever found <laughs> yellow limestone here? Yeah, it's very yellow. Yeah, very it's yellow. Very packed it's full of fusilinates. It seems softer too, but I don't know. It is soft. I'll have okay. to bring some. That's bring some of yours in. I'll bring it over. Yeah. And I'll bring some of mine in. Seems like some of the cat wood doesn't right. actually weather. Yeah. 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 yeah, we're just four miles away. We have a lot of it. And I'll bring. Do you guys know what I'm talking about with Sue Forte? So. You should bring some. I will. Uh, I've got plenty. Um, so. What was this 15,000 years ago? 10 to 15,000 years ago when the, the last one left 12,000 years ago. Thank you. So the, the, the glacier came down from Sorry. South Dakota oh, and, it, and it picked up it picked up some of the pink yeah. quartzite from the Sioux area, you know, Lakota area. 
And that's where I'm from. I'm from Sioux Falls. Mm -hmm. And so every old building in downtown Sioux Falls is constructed out of this pink quartzite. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is nobody realizes it's pink. Or they've just forgotten because they, you know, that's the courthouse. And I'm like, well, the courthouse is pink. I now know that having lived in Kansas where everything is white, right? From the last mm -hmm. And I go home and I'm like, do you guys realize that this is all pink and that this is pink Sioux Quartzite? And then when we moved to our house, there it was, big chunks of pink Sioux Quartzite mm -hmm. in my front yard, which I didn't appreciate because I had to try to mow around all this, but I knew mm -hmm. how it got there. And so basically the, the glacier came down and stopped in my front yard. <laughs> What's really cool about it, it was a continental glacier. So, you know, the estimate is anywhere from you know, half a mile to two miles high. Yeah. So imagine looking from here and looking north and seeing, seeing the Colorado that. Rockies, mm. only its eyes. Do you actually have, I was reading about the Arabs a little bit further up here, you could see the big pieces of rock that came down. If you me. want any of it. Yeah, I can come look at it. <laughs> no, I'll bring it. <laughs> the garments, I used to be the garments are in, uh, 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 <laughs> it's so true. Very, and, and it, and it looks, it's is so completely different from limestone. In fact, I, I, got, I brought you some pink. We can find garnets in the glacial too. It's in our land. I'll bring some more in the glacial too. Can we take a look at the right here and do our restroom break over at the barn so we can go? There's one thing I want to add. OK, so what's what's kids' favorite thing to do when they get out here, or well, I'll tell you what the kids' favorite thing to do when they get out here and you start talking about rocks. Pick up a rock, mm -hmm. put it in a pocket. Mm -hmm. Is that a cool thing to do? Mm -hmm. No. So that, Byron. <laughs> he's gone. It's amazing. He's got all his rocks he wants he's over like, his place. He's like the seven-year-old kid that never grew up. So, so don't let him put, keep an eye on them. Oh, they're sneaky. So they're not supposed to take stuff. And don't mm -hmm. let them take flowers. Don't take them, let them take flowers. Even if, and we had this conversation this morning, even if it's a sweet little girl who's got this flower and, and she brought it to you to identify, she's like, can I take this home and give this to my mom? I'm sorry, you can't. And if, if you don't want to tell them that, send them to me or Haley. Because what will happen, what will happen is somebody will hear that you let her mm -hmm. take a flower and they want to bring a flower to their mom and then, and then it's on. It's on. So they are not allowed to take things off of Kansa Prairie and take them all. They need to learn that lesson because that's true in all of our state parks and national parks and other public places. We respect the site. Even if, you know, if they've already picked the flower, but the flower needs to stay. So we're going to put the flower down over here next to the tree where it has some shade. <laughs>